Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. Thanks so much for listening. This is kind of an old school uh, show this week. It's just you and me, Clay, and it was great fun. Uh, you reported in about a recent trip uh, to Philadelphia. Now, we're recording this in the middle of June, and that's a, you went at the beginning of June, I think, right? Yeah, so this was June 9th or 10th, I think. And, uh-huh. and so about the time in 1804 that Alexander von Humboldt, the great Prussian polymath and explorer, visited Thomas Jefferson in Washington, D.C., but he began that North American side trip in Philadelphia and got to see the Library Company of Philadelphia and got to go to the American Philosophical Society and the University of Pennsylvania. We don't know whether he saw the orrery, but we all agreed probably he did. And so that was my journey to give an endowed lecture, which was on Humboldt and Jefferson. But the lecture, which I'm quite pleased with and and they seem to enjoy, um, was the least of it. (laughs) The most of it was the cultural tour that I was, um, was gifted by these extraordinary friends and, and, and leaders of, of the Library Company of Philadelphia, the American Philosophical Society, and the Academy of Natural Sciences, not to mention the University of Pennsylvania. And during the show, we, we really go into that in detail, and I don't want to even give away some of the amazing things you saw. People can listen and hear the details, but it was real fun to hear them uh, directly from you and to hear what an effect they had on you personally. That's the show this week. I have to remember to thank everyone who has decided to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And if you'd like to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour, go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Donate. There's a number of ways to do it. We really appreciate it. I do appreciate our listeners. I know some of them are going to be absolutely green with envy, including one Russ Eagle. I wrote to him and sent him a couple of pictures, and he cursed me uh, by text and email uh, for my great Good fortune. Let's go to the show. Uh, last chance for you to uh, uh, let people know what you're up to. I think we still have a couple of places on the French on the France trip, so that's um, still a possibility. Winter encampments are full, but the waiting lists are often useful. Next summer, back out on the Lewis and Clark Trail. So join us. Online courses are coming, including one on the ten most important photographs of the 20th century. Uh, so lots and lots. Go to jeffersonhour.com to see more. Plus. I want everyone to uh, to start getting excited about our Listening to America project and the Jefferson Hour morphing in that direction. So lots and lots going on. I don't think, David, I've ever been more busy in the whole course of my life. And I think you're in that position too. Fun, huh? Yes, it is. It's The lucky thing is, is we both enjoy what we do so much. Thanks, everyone. Good day, citizens, and welcome to this week's edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm your host, David Swenson, joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And Clay, it's been an interesting month. We've had some very special guests and contributors. And This week, sir, it's just you and me. I wanted to have this conversation because I know you just returned from Philadelphia, where you, I believe, gave a lecture and also got to see some very interesting things. And I I asked you if we couldn't have this conversation because I wanted more details. A couple of years ago, I led a group of Monticello's donors and some of their favorite scholars on my annual Lewis and Clark tour in Montana and Idaho. And so this group of about 15 people uh, from Monticello, including its CEO, came and we had a spectacular week. Uh, and this included uh, two eminent scholars, John Van Horn of the Library Company of Philadelphia, who played a key role in the Franklin Papers, and Charles Cullen, who was for many years the editor of the Jefferson Papers. So here are two world-class editors and historians on this trip, and I'm leading them into these crazy places, including the famous Wendover Death March. And that was that. But then I stayed in touch with them, and about Eight months ago, John Van Horn, who's now retired, but for 30 years was the head of the Library Company of Philadelphia, Um, from his retirement, uh, he helped to endow something called the John Van Horn Endowed Lecture. And he said, would I come give it? So, of course, I was thrilled. But um, he said, what would you like to talk about? I gave him a list, and he said, yeah, the one on Humboldt and Jefferson is probably the one that will be most appropriate for this gathering. So I worked really hard on this because this was going to be like one of the most intense 
lectures and presentations of my life. And I went there, but they insisted that I come early, which I was more than happy to do. And for two and a half days, David, they took me around to the most spectacular archives. I got to see so many things. We can talk about them one by one. I know you saw many fascinating things, and I want to hear about all of them in detail. But but before we go there, there are listeners who are probably not aware of Alexander von Humboldt. Humboldt was this extraordinary young man, a genius, I mean, a true genius. And Humboldt knew all of these Enlightenment sciences, an early anthropologist. He was an expert at celestial observation and latitude and longitude. He knew Linnaean classification. He was a mineralogist. He was an early exponent of volcanism, which believed that the the earth has been changed rapidly and dramatically by volcanic events and so on. So he was one of the best prepared people ever to undertake the journey that he did. And between 1799, he's Prussian, born in Prussia, between 1799 and 1804, he traveled in the northern segments of South America, including the Andes. He explored the Orinoco River, which is one of the most difficult um, wild rivers in the world. He then went to Mexico, where he spent a year in the archives there. Um, trying to learn everything he could about the future of human liberty. He was a small R Republican uh, in the New World uh, and making a map which was extremely influential, one of the first maps of what we would call the American Southwest. Then he went to Cuba, and he was about to go back to Europe, to Paris, where he was going to begin to publish his results. It, It eventually led to 30 full volumes of his report. While he was in Cuba, he got the idea maybe from the American consul there, that maybe he would divert his journey, not from Havana to Paris, but from Havana to Philadelphia because he wanted to meet Thomas Jefferson. And he said he wrote this beautiful letter to Jefferson on May 24th, 1804, saying, I, I would be remiss if I went back to the old world without paying my respects to the great statesman and philosopher of the new world. Would you mind terribly much if I visited? He also wanted to see a republic. He wanted to see the world's first republic, at least the first since ancient Rome. And he wanted to see what liberty looked like on the ground. And so Jefferson wrote a somewhat embarrassed letter back saying, sure, come on, but don't expect much from the new national capital in Washington, D.C. So Humboldt came and he had about 10 days in Washington. And Jefferson, of course, put on one of his dinners for Humboldt and his friends. And Humboldt and Jefferson had many, many, many conversations. Unfortunately, we don't know a lot about them because there was no James Boswell. There was no one to record them. And Charles Wilson Peale, who had a a very good diary, just said they talked about natural history and they talked about manners and they talked about conveniences and amenities. And, you know, you just wish that he would have gone into greater detail. But we know that two more like-minded Enlightenment people could never have met. And one of the things I talked about in my lecture, David, is that if Humboldt had come a year earlier, he might have met Meriwether Lewis. Imagine the conversations that Lewis could have had with him, because Humboldt had just been for five grueling years in Central and South America, and he could have taught Lewis many, many important things. And and I even speculated in my lecture that it is not 100% out of the question to think that Humboldt might have asked to go along. And if he had gone along on the Lewis and Clark expedition, we'd be having a... Everything would be different, right? So different, because Lewis was a very talented amateur and a great military commander, and I have deep respect for him, as you know, and I know you do, but he was no Humboldt. I mean, Humboldt was like... He's like Carl Sagan plus Robert Oppenheimer plus Neil Armstrong bottled into one human being. And I think that if he had gone, we wouldn't call it the Lewis and Clark expedition. It would have been the Humboldt expedition with Lewis and Clark as their military escort. <laughs> you always like to recommend books. And and honestly, the, the first that I really learned a lot about Humboldt was um, a book by Andrea Wolf that you recommended to me called The Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World. Um, and I think you would join me in recommending that to listeners to learn more about him. W- one of the things I do recall from the book was that Jefferson called him, quote, one of the greatest ornaments of the age. <laughs> That's Indeed. great. And later, they co- they corresponded for the rest of Jefferson's life, and quite regularly, too. And Jefferson 
wrote a letter, I think in 1813, to Humboldt, who was now back in uh, Europe, and he said, my very dear friend and baron. And Jefferson didn't talk that way to anybody, not to Adams, not to Madison. So, you know, Jefferson collected protégés, and he liked young men who were, in a sense, old enough to be his son. Lewis was one of them. William Short was another. But here's Humboldt, and you just get the sense that Jefferson embraced Humboldt as sort of the ideal surrogate son that he never had, because if Jefferson had had a son like Humboldt, imagine what that could have meant for uh, exploration and, and for the United States. And, and they have this wonderful correspondence. Let me just give you one more little piece of it. So Humboldt comes and goes in June of 1804. Then he writes Jefferson a letter saying, oh, you know, I have a copy of your great book, which I've read, by the way, devoured, Notes on the State of Virginia, but I'd like a copy signed by you. Oh, right, yes. I remember And so that. then Jefferson says, okay, and he sent him one. And that book may still exist. It probably still exists, but it's been lost. But here's what's so important about that. A book is a book. But when Jefferson signed a book, it wasn't like, good luck, Thomas Jefferson, or best wishes, Jefferson wrote little essayettes. I mean, like in his tiny little handwriting, he might have written three or 400 words, and I'm sure he did, because he did that for Lafayette and he did that for others with notes on Virginia. So if we had that, it would be a priceless document. And I've looked into it. Apparently during World War, it was in his brother Wilhelm's collection in Berlin. Uh, and apparently during World War II, it was lost. So presumably it was taken by the Soviets or by the Americans or by somebody, and we may never recover it, but it would be one of the great artifacts of the Jefferson Humboldt world if we could find it. You know, before we go to the break, I, I, I got to go back to that book. I could reread that book. The Andrea Wolf. Of, oh, it's so The good. Invention of Nature. It's excellent. And, and I'm sure you recall, um, I, I think it was uh, the prologue to the book. There's this wonderful description of von Humboldt climbing, I think, a volcano in South America. Mount Chamborazo, this, the, one of the highest peaks in the Andes, is 20,500 and some feet. Yeah, and it, it, she she explains it in detail. This was not a, a, not an, a, something for the faint of heart to attempt. First of all, people didn't do it then. Mountain climbing, as we understand it, is a much later phenomenon, late 19th century, 20th century, whereas now today you have people that have gone to the peaks on all the continents and you know, all the Everest people right. and so on. The, now Everest is, actually has traffic jams because it's so popular. At this time, this was very rare. The Alps had not yet become the Alps, as we understand them. When Theodore Roosevelt climbed the Matterhorn on his honeymoon, <laughs> he was one of the first people ever to climb the Matterhorn. Like, he was the 20th person ever to climb the Matterhorn. So when Humboldt did this, without oxygen, of course, you know, I've been on top of Mount Whitney. And it, it was over 20,000 feet, too. You can barely it? breathe. I mean, it's tough. You, every few steps at 14,000 some feet, you're bending over and taking deep breaths. To get to 20,000 plus is an extraordinary achievement and somewhat of a reckless one without oxygen or without proper guides, but he did well, it. <laughs> Nobody had oxygen in those days. So, no, or yeah. guides. So he did, they thought this was like the highest peak in the world. At the time, it was thought to be the highest peak. But but then, like, if you read his, this book by Andrea Wolf or his journal, which is spectacular, like, he's in Mexico, and every third day he's climbing a 14 or a volcano, because, or 15,000 he wants to see. what Because at the time, volcanism was not well understood. And so he was one of the pioneers. And what he, what he understood, well, here's, here's, what, here's a Jefferson connection that's so great. In his letter to Jefferson, David, he said, you know, when some of the things we might talk about, one is that I happen to have found mammoth teeth at 11,000 feet in the Andes. Well, Jefferson loved the mammoth the way a seven-year-old loves the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I mean, Jefferson was just a <laughs> maniac and obsessive, the mammoth, everything. <laughs> That's a I mean, great way to put it. Couldn't get enough mammoth, you know, the way those kids are in Jurassic Park. That's Jefferson. And he was he sent out William Clark and Meriwether Lewis and George Rogers Clark to get mammoth bones and you know mammoth everything and he, and he was widely ridiculed by the Federalists and the press for his mammoth obsessions. But at any rate, so Humboldt couldn't have written a sentence more likely to to get right to the heart of Jefferson's fascination because how did those bones get 
to 11,000 feet. One can easily understand why Jefferson was so fascinated with von Humboldt. We need to take a short break. When we come back, I'll give you an opportunity to tell us more about von Humboldt, or we can go to what I want to hear about, which is your trip and the things you saw. Well, I want to say a few more things about Humboldt, but then I'll tell you about the treasures of Philadelphia that I was able to hold in my own little scrubbed hands. Excellent. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, a one-on-one conversation with Clay Jenkinson about his recent trip to Philadelphia. He gave a lecture there, and he also saw and held some very precious items, which I'm hoping we'll talk about in this segment. But I, I got the feeling you had a few more things you wanted to add about von Humboldt. Well, just two, David. First of all, the, the mammoth teeth at 11,000 feet. Mammoths don't graze at 11,000 feet. So that tells you that there has been uplift. And so that uplift is a... that I use this phrase in my endowed lecture. I said, that blew Jefferson's mind because that meant that the earth is not a static thing that was created in six days by God in 4004 BC. He the earth, recognized that. Yeah. And it's, wow. he, he had this sense. He was already in notes on Virginia. Jefferson talked about shells that had been found at 15,000 feet in the Andes and so on. And so he's trying to figure how can that be? Was Noah's flood? Did it get to that height? And then of course, Jefferson works out. No, there's not enough water for it ever have to got, to have gotten to that height. And so he's beginning to tap at the door of what we would call earth dynamics or, you know, continental shifts and so on, tectonics and volcanism. And then, so, but Jefferson doesn't know and notes on Virginia says, well, we really don't know much about these shells and maybe they aren't even shells. Maybe they're some kind of organic effusions from nature. That was Voltaire's view. Anyway, so then Humboldt says, hey, (laughs) I have teeth, mammoth teeth from 11,000 feet. That means that this confirms that there has been uplift because those mammoths were probably grazing at near sea level or, you know, 2,000 feet above sea level. And so for Jefferson, he's like, I got to talk to that guy. I want to hear that. So that's one thing, David. And, and And, you know, when we talk about this, it sounds like, oh, well, what's the big deal? That's like discovering that there's a new planet. This blows Jefferson's mind. Secondly, this is a story, and apparently it's true because we have two contemporary sources. One day, Humboldt is there, and Jefferson's in his office at the White House doing something. Humboldt's waiting in the lobby, and he picks up this newspaper. I know you know this story. And the newspaper is has an awful, mean-spirited, disgusting attack on Jefferson personally. I mean, it's not like policy. It's, it's an ad hominem, mean-spirited, a federalist newspaper attack on Jefferson. So nasty it was. Indeed. Nasty. So then Jefferson comes out in his slippers, you know, as Jefferson, and in, in in his gracious kind of Jane Austen way. And Humboldt holds up this this uh, newspaper. And he says, "Why is it this man in prison? Why is it? This, how could this even be allowed? That this scurrilous attack? I mean, what? Why is it this person incarcerated?" And then Jefferson, in his calm way, says, Baron, put that in your pocket and take that back to the old world. And when they ask you what freedom means, show them that. That's a great story. (laughs) Apparently it's true. I mean, it's probably been exaggerated, but it's so Jefferson, right? Because you know. Exaggerated or not, the point is well made. But Jefferson was so thin-skinned, he hated this kind of attack on himself, but he also understood what's at stake in a free society that if you if you start to button up the press you gain and you lose but you lose way more than you gain so you're in philadelphia you've given this lecture and what happens next and they're like i I arrive on a sunday night i check into the renaissance hotel which is right across right next door to the american philosophical society and a block and a half away from the library company and they said we have some things planned for you for your time here because I have all Monday and most of Tuesday before I have to give the lecture. The lecture winds up being the least interesting part of this whole story. So the first of all, we start at the library company, and they're showing me treasures. <laughs> I can't tell you about all of them. I'll tell you about one. They hold up 
Duprat's History of Louisiana, which was a book published in the 18th century, that Lewis borrowed from Benjamin Smith Barton of Philadelphia for the trip. He took it all the way to the Pacific Ocean and back again. And then when he got back, he, in 1807, to Philadelphia, he gave the book back. He, he returned the book to Benjamin Smith Barton, and the book is in really good condition. You can't believe that it crossed the continent with blizzards and water accidents and wind and heat and all the other things to which it must have been exposed. But here's what he said, David. I'm looking at the photograph I got to take of the book as I held it in my hands at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Here's what, you, you have photographs of these items. Yes, and we'll post some, but here's what... Can, can, you can share them and we can get them on the website. I'd love to. Here's what Lewis said when he returned the book. Dr. Benjamin Smith Barton was so obliging as to lend me this copy of Monsignor de Pratz's History of Louisiana in June 1803. It has been since conveyed by me to the Pacific Ocean through the interior of the continent of North America on my late tour and it is now returned to its proprietor by his friend and obedient servant, Meriwether Lewis, Philadelphia, May 7th, 1807. It's in Lewis's handwriting in this book, which I held, they allowed me to hold in my hands and page through, and the map is there. And Think of it. This book came right through... North Dakota, it, it it passed within a mile or two of the New Enlightenment Radio Network barn twice, once going and once coming, and I held it. it it's kind of like, the what what is that thing, eight degrees from Kevin Bacon? That puts you like one degree from Meriwether Lewis. I mean, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I was it like- It doesn't sound ridiculous at all. To think that the book survived the journey at all, A, that the book was in great shape, B- that he returned it to Benjamin Smith Barton, C, and D, that he wrote this inscription in it, and it survived and is now one of the treasures of the Library Company of Philadelphia. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, it's just like at the end of, 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 of the first day, I was emotionally and intellectually exhausted, and that was just day one. So I got to put my reporter hat on and ask you a couple questions. Uh, describe the book. I mean, is it is it a large volume? Is it small? Is it leather bound? It's leather bound, beautifully bound. It's a, it's a fat little quarto, so it's about the size of a trade paperback, only beautifully bound in that 18th century way. It was Duprat's History of Louisiana, so Duprat's is French. It's a history of the greater Louisiana, so really a history of the American West from a, a European, a continental, French-Spanish point of view. It was one of the few books that Lewis could take that would help him maybe understand the places that he was attempting to explore. And so he carried it. They had about 11 books. We're not quite sure uh, that they carried in their private library, and this was one of them. It looks like a rare book that you would see in a museum or the Library of Congress, but it has this particular inscription. Uh, I have to I have to ask you about that. The inscription, you explained that beautifully, but um, you know there are people who get books and they underline and they make notes in the sidebar, and um, then there are people who think that's something you just should not do. do. You got to page through it. Were there notes? No. But it was it was clear that Lewis had used it. For one thing, the pages were cut, and in books of that time, sometimes the pages were were not cut. But Lewis was not did not deface this book except at the end when he wrote the inscription. But of course, the inscription is what makes the book valuable and identifiable. But you know, he used it very carefully, and so that really points to something in Lewis. That's not easy. If I went on a camping trip for a month and took a book like that, keeping it in pristine condition would be almost impossible, even with, you know, Ziploc bags and you know, tightly sealed uh, containers and so on. Yeah, uh, we all know the stories about you and the canoe tipping over on your list. Had, to, had to bring it up. You know, Becky yeah. dumped me over. Yeah, but we will yeah. let that go. Okay. But yes, yeah, so, so it's in great shape. And when Lewis was here in our North Dakota, he was visited by a couple of British uh, traders and, and agents from the Winnipeg area. And he actually loaned a book to one of them. He says, I loaned the book to this guy. 
he doesn't say which, and there's kind of a parlor game in Lewis and Clark world about which book he might have loaned to him. I don't think it was this one. It was either probably Mackenzie's Voyages from Montreal, which is about a similar transcontinental journey in Canada, or it was one of the, Lewis was carrying a four-volume Dictionary of Arts and Sciences, so basically an encyclopedia that maybe one of these bored British factors wanted to borrow to while away the time up there near Winnipeg. We don't know, but we do know that this is the only book that we can we can actually touch and point to that actually made the journey and came back again. You mentioned earlier that this was in connection with the American Philosophical Society. That's where the lecture was, right. The same society that Benjamin Franklin was part of? 1743, uh, for the promotion of useful knowledge. Jefferson was for 18 years the president of the American Philosophical Society, including during the time that Humboldt visited him in Washington. And they were the ones who arranged your viewing of all these items. Is that correct? So John Van Horn, my my friend and the person who invited me, made contacts with all these institutions, and they opened their doors mostly, I'm sure, for him. But I was the beneficiary. And so that next day, uh, we went into this beautiful library at the American Philosophical Society, and there was a splendid uh, woman named Valerie Ann Lutz, who was one of the curators, and uh, she had this whole table filled with treasures, uh, broadsides about the mammoth, and actual notes by Alexander von Humboldt, etc. But the piece de resistance on that day was the actual journals of Lewis and Clark. They have the mother load. Missouri Historical Society has uh, another smaller group uh, the Newberry Library has the White House Journal, but the, most of the journals, thanks to Thomas Jefferson, wound up in the American Philosophical Society. And I will tell you this, I've been at Lewis and Clark for, I suppose, four decades, maybe five, in different ways. I've published on this. I've edited the journals of Lewis and Clark for North Dakota. I'm the editor of We Proceeded On, the Lewis and Clark uh, Quarterly Journal. Lewis and Clark has been one of the three or four central things in my life, in my intellectual life, and I had never held one of the journals, and I frankly never thought I would. And so there I am, and they said, go ahead, uh -huh. you know, pick it up and carefully page through and see what you think. White gloves on, I expect? Yes. Now, that, that, the white glove era is sort of going away because white gloves can actually do more damage than they protect. But yes, so I didn't very know careful. That. Yeah, so it used yeah. to be white gloves, and now they think... So there you are in Philadelphia... Holding the journals. After four or five decades of thinking about this, writing about this, studying this, investigating this, there you are, and you get to hold a journal. You know, so, and, and there are millions... And then your heart stopped the end. Oh, right? absolutely. You know, be, because, you know, I have probably five or 600 books on Lewis and Clark. I've got many copies of the journals. They're really? online. You know, the, but, but it's one thing to have Gary Moulton's monumental public edition of 13 volumes of Lewis and Clark. You can get everything that Lewis and Clark said right there. But the difference between that and holding it in your little hand, so I am holding it. There are about 20 or more of them. But I've got this one in my hand. And of course, I said what you know I said. I said I, I started to put it behind my back and said, what a great gift. <laughs> and that's when the SWAT team descended from the ceiling. Uh, it was one of the one of the happiest, most satisfying, most thrilling moments of my life. So as familiar as you are with the journals, you picked up this volume and did you immediately go and start to read and check the handwriting and all that? Yes, I've seen them in facsimile and there is a, there's there are some print versions, facsimile versions which I have a couple of and I've seen them online and so on, but that's not the same thing. And so I, they had opened it to this a couple of maps, one map of the mouth of the Columbia and another map, I think, of the snake. And then there, they'd opened another one to one of the doodlings. They often made little images of uh, condors or candlefish or other item, pronghorn antelopes in the journals. And so they had, the, you know, they knew where to open them. I wasn't there long enough that, to do what I would have loved to do. And so they said, come back. You can come back anytime and you can spend a week with these and you can go through them one by one. Because what I discovered, David, is that, you know, there's, you, you know, better than I, there are all these basic images of Lewis and Clark that you see over and over and over and over again. There were other doodlings and, and little drawings in the journals that I have never seen. 
And so I would like, as the editor, if we proceeded on, to go through all of them and get scans of everything that that's not normal. So if there's an ink spill, if there's a different colored pen, if there's a tear, if there's a doodling, because those are what are valuable in a way that you can't get from just reading an online edition. I suspect that would take you more than a week, but you've kind of answered the next question that I was going to ask, which is, did this give you a further insight? And and obviously it did. Well, a couple of things. First of all, there's more to see than we knew. Um, and there's nothing like, you know, I know this from my work at the Theodore Roosevelt Digitization Project in at Dickinson State University. It's one thing to read a linear transcription of something. It's a, As you know, it's a whole different thing to see it in its original. So there's that. And you feel close. You feel close to history because whatever else is true, Meriwether Lewis touched that book. I've touched the book that Meriwether Lewis touched. I know it sounds mystical, but it's true. Secondly, as my friend Stephen Dow Beckham has told me for many years, these aren't the field journals. There are no mosquitoes. There are no tears. There's no blood. There's no coffee stain. There's no raindrop. These were copies that Lewis and Clark made probably when they got back to St. Louis, maybe out at Fort Clatsop, but they're pristine. They look as if they are professional, clean, in their handwriting, facsimiles of what the field journals must have been. And of course, that leads to the great concern and question, where are those original journals lost? What we have is Clark's field notes that were discovered in St. Paul in the 1950s and and White House's, private White House's journal is at the Newberry Library, and it looks like a field journal. It looks like it's been run over by bulldozers and dropped in rivers and stitched back together, and even the cover, which is leather, has a patch in it. That's what the journals must have been. So what we're looking at are these pristine copies that were made per Jefferson's instructions so that they could then be used by whoever put the report together. Uh. That's interesting. I didn't realize that that had happened. We've talked many times about how Jefferson was so disappointed that Lewis did not complete them. And in a way, he did, but not the way that Jefferson wanted. This was step one. Make a fair copy of your journal so that somebody can read it. Step two is, is to be humble. 30 volumes of findings. And Lewis was not going to do that, but he, he, he did uh, publish a prospectus for three volumes. And presumably that transcription was going to be used to incorporate ch chunks of it as the actual narrative. And then he would write continuity and larger reflections and so on and so forth. So it was step one in the publication process. As you said, you know, in the fifties, journals were found. What do you think the chances are that the originals still exist somewhere and they're buried in an archive? Unknowable. So in the 1990s, 50-some letters were found in an attic in Louisville that were Clark letters to his brother, Jonathan. They've played a significant role, particularly on the question of the afterlife of the expedition once they got back in 1806, and, and they point a little bit towards Lewis's suicide. So that's a discovery. As I said, the Field Journal of Clark in a St. Paul attic in the 1950s, there's we hear rumors that there was a private diary of Lewis and a couple of times I've sort of gotten, you know, the, how that works. I'm sure you've done this with your own work. You get kind of close and then it turns out to be a dry hole. But I would say the chances that there, that if you had an x-ray machine that would scan the globe and it would, it would be tuned to anything written by William Clark or Meriwether Lewis or any member of their expedition, of course there's more out there, but the, it might be mis filed in a museum. It might be in private hands that know about it and don't want anyone else to know about. It might be in someone's attic. We just don't know. But the fact that every X number of years something is found makes it seem to me that we're not done yet. Well, when they rewrote it, you can't imagine that they would have destroyed the originals. Wouldn't think so. We could speculate on and on and on, but really what we need to do now is take another break. You take a short break. But when we come back, there's a couple of other things. It get, just go, there's more coming. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, as I said earlier, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the creator of The Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. 
who has recently returned from Philadelphia, where he gave a lecture about Baron Alexander von Humboldt. And you also had a tour arranged by the American Philosophical Society. And the, and the Library Company of Philadelphia, who were my hosts. So let me just say, I'm sure our listeners can hear my animation. In my life, I have seldom been as thrilled as I was last week. I feel so um, thrilled and, and humbled. All these doors of these places that you can hardly get through the door are swinging open for me, and I know what I've got here. So this woman, Valerie Ann Lutz, who's a curator at the APS, said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry that, uh, you know, we have Jefferson's second draft of the Declaration of Independence, but it's in uh, conservation because it, they're they're concerned about the integrity of, of one of the pages. I'm so sorry. Uh, we won't be able to show that to you. And then I went to see some other things, and an hour later she came back and said, no, they're going to let us look. So we went into conservation, which is where they take these things and redo the bindings. You know, there's very, very, very careful work. It, it's an art form. And they want to do as little adjustment as they possibly can, but to conserve and to stabilize these things. And there it was. Um, it's two sheets written on both sides in Jefferson's hand, the second draft, not the final draft, the second draft of the Declaration of Independence. And I got to hold it, but only to turn the page, not to like hold it up against the light. And, you know, you, you don't read it. You, you just adore it. But here's what's so interesting. You know the famous paragraph about the slave trade. That, right. The longest single paragraph of the Declaration. Yeah, but explain that for listeners who might not know about that. So Jefferson, you know, had this indictment of George the Third. You know, he's quartered troops in our houses, and he's carried us across the sea, and he's excited the slaves to revolt, and he's stirred up the Indians of the West, and this long indictment of George the Third. And the longest single paragraph in that list was Jefferson saying that the the king and the parliament had perpetuated the slave trade when we, we Americans probably would have done the right thing on this question if they'd only left us alone, which was palpable nonsense. But Jefferson was using this as propaganda, and he also wanted to make a statement about slavery in the Declaration and the Birth Certificate of the United States. Anyway, Congress uh, omitted it at the insistence of the Carolinas and Georgia. So what Jefferson did, David, is on the on the margins of this thing, he bracketed that whole paragraph as if to say that was that was taken out. So there you see his bracket, and you just think, "Wow!" So it's one thing; it's a document. We all know the Declaration of Independence. You could read this on one thousand, maybe ten thousand, maybe one hundred thousand websites in the next hour if you want to, and you can see scans of it in all of its forms. But when you're in there three inches away and you see that in his in his hurt feelings or his annoyance, he brackets that paragraph. You feel his pen, you feel his angst, you feel a lost moment in American history. You, you, it's it's something much bigger than a bit of ink on a piece of paper. There were there was exchanges about editing between he and Benjamin Franklin and and how difficult this was on Jefferson. And I have a, one more question, but go ahead. He had to sit there in, as in the Virginia delegation while the members of Congress debated it, and they were you know they were the kind of people who who have egos and they want to hold forth and make their own contributions to this. And it was agonizing for Jefferson, who was a very, very shy and private man. And he said he couldn't leave because a gentleman couldn't leave and you couldn't argue for your own draft because a gentleman couldn't do that. So he was just paralyzed in kind of a cold sweat and 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 seething as Congress said, well, let's change this and let's move, I move that paragraph and that sort of thing. And so Franklin then told him this kind of amusing story to try to cheer Jefferson up, but Jefferson never got over it. He said that Congress, quote, mangled his text, and he had his own version of it ready to give to people to say, this was what it was meant to be. Huh. So this was the second draft. Um, so the chronological order of things, I mean, he did his first draft. There's I think that's that, Library of Congress or National Archives. And there's that famous story about uh, Franklin 
uh, saying self evident and you know yeah changing. I can't remember what what, what it, Jefferson had said. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, and Franklin said no. We hold these truths to be self evident, and we, we we believe that's true. Correct. We believe at about ninety four percent that that's true. That was his first draft, and then he wrote this second draft. Because now he's had to incorporate the changes that Adams and Franklin have suggested. So it's still in committee. This was after yes. Franklin and Adams made their suggestions. Was it prior to it going to? Yes. So that means those brackets come later, right? Because the second draft oh. then goes to Congress. Congress does what it does with it, mangles his draft. Then Jefferson wrote the brackets. That's that's what I wanted to know. Is that this the bracketing happened after Congress had, as you say, mangled it? Right, and of course we can't one hundred percent know that those are Jefferson's brackets. They could have been the person who printed it. They could have, you know, we, you can't tell that that's Jefferson hand. You can tell if he wrote the word truth or America. We would automatically know if it's Jefferson or not. But to put a a, a bracket around a paragraph. That could be anybody, but presumably Jefferson. Uh, that's fascinating. That must have been a real moment for you. All praise to Valerie Ann Lutz, who made this possible for me. So these are just a few of the treasures that I got to see in the American Philosophical Society. But there's more. <laughs> but there's one more. Yeah, there's more. The orrery. And again, you know, there are probably listeners who don't know what we're talking about. So can you set that up? An orrery is a planetarium. So you can all kind of envision a planetarium. Um, but it's a more elaborate one. It's a clock-like planetarium. And it was done by David Rittenhouse. The first orrery comes from Lord Orrery, a British uh, uh, aristocrat who was interested in these things and designed the first of these planetariums, which is I've seen. Not to get too lost in this, but tell us about Rittenhouse. Right. So Rittenhouse is the is the uh, director of the U.S. Mint. Uh, he's a genius. He's a mathematician. He's a clockmaker. Jefferson adored him and wrote him fan letters. And so Rittenhouse decided to make his own model of the universe. And it's the size of a big sideboard. It's like nine feet tall and 14 or 15 feet wide and has... Really? No, I thought it was miniature. It's not. It's like... Me Think too. of the stereo console that your parents had when you were a child and now multiply it by about six. It's this huge <laughs> thing, beautiful woodwork, and there are all these gears and planets and uh, the names of stars and the and the and the the zodiac and and the moons and Jupiter's moons, and it all has gears and it works. So that when you used to be able to run it, it would you could tune it to any day in human history and it would show you what the sky looked like. And so it's a magnificent thing. And Jefferson wrote to Rittenhouse and said, I want one. I'll give anything to have one. Can you make me one? He never did. But so when John Van Horn invited me to give this lecture, he said, is there anything you really want to do while you're in Philadelphia? And I said, not thinking they were going to throw open the doors of all these institutions for me. I said, I've never seen the orrery and I would really like to see it. So on day two, we're on our way to the Academy of Natural Sciences to see the plants of the Lewis and Clark expedition and some bones we can talk about. But on the way, we stopped at the University of Pennsylvania, and there in the library, it is behind glass, and it's no longer running, of course, but I got to see it, and <laughs> our host said, thousands and thousands and thousands of students wander through this every day of, of the year, and nobody ever even notices it. And there we were, and it was just like, Oh, what can I compare it to? You know, it's like, well, I've been to Greenwich and I've seen some of the clocks there, like Harrison's famous chronometer, but uh, it's thrilling. And to think that, you know, Jefferson wrote this fan letter to Rittenhouse about this, and he said, the model you have made of the universe is so ingenious, it's second only to the original. It's like the best thing except God's own universe. It's it's second only to the original. <laughs> In it, that's so Jefferson. Like, and he says, "I'll pay any price, bear any burden, get me one of these." Thank goodness Rittenhouse didn't, because it would have bankrupted Jefferson fifty years earlier. At Rittenhouse, this is the only one he made. No, well, there are no, there are a couple of them. Uh, this is the only complete one. I think Princeton has the other one, and it's not complete. And and these people at UPenn, they were fabulous, but they were pretty sneery about Princeton. Like, oh, there's it doesn't really. It's, <laughs> a bunch of stuff is missing. You know, we only, we're we're the only ones that have the complete orrery. Like that never happens, right? <laughs> and I said, I'll give you anything to run it, and they said, uh, no, no, yeah, 
Yeah. So that, well, but then we got to see the plants at the Academy of Natural Sciences. So they have all of the 200 plant specimens that Lewis brought back. A bunch of them were lost in Montana in a in a cash pit that that flooded. But there they are. And so they said, which would you like to see? <laughs> so I said, how about how about the bitterroot, which is called Luisia rediviva, in Lewis's honor, the bitterroot, which is the state flower of Montana. So he goes in, pulls out this. It's like a poster board, only it's very thick and protected. And there it is with Lewis's little handwriting about when he got it and so on. Oh, my. But but one more thing, David. The same tour of the Academy of Natural Sciences, they took me to the fossil room. And they had mammoth teeth that Jefferson owned and mastodon really? teeth that Jefferson Oh, yeah. And they're like, but I've seen, I've seen that at Monticello. And I mean, it was, don't get me wrong. I wasn't blasé about it, but... Then he pulls this shelf out. You think of these like this giant white metallic shelf system. And he pulls the shelf out. He says, what do you think that is? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. He said, that's the Megalonyx. So Jefferson in 1797 wrote a pioneering paleontological article for the American Philosophical Society on the Great Claw, which he named the Megalonyx. And he wrote this really interesting learned paper about it. it's been since discredited to a certain degree from a real paleontologist but it was a pioneering work and there were the bones of this thing it's actually a giant sloth but there they were and and he held up this image from a, a publication from the american philosophical society of the configuration of the bones and they're in the same place the actual bones are in the same configuration in this Temperature controlled, uh, very carefully um, conserved shelf, and I said, "How many people ever want to see that?" He said, "Well, none. You know, <laughs> I mean, a few." Well, but you know that that kind of leads me into a, the minutes that we have left. Sort of a, a a conclusion about all this. Now, if if there are people who are not inclined, say, as you and I are, to uh, have this reverent attitude about these historical artifacts. I'm sure if we lost them in the broadcast a long time ago, but no. you know, I, I've been working on this project and it's it's geared towards Lakota youth and-, and Cylinder re discs. Repatriating things. But the reason I bring it up is that there's a, a good friend, an elder in uh, Belcourt, North Dakota on the Turtle Mountain Reservation, Dan Jerome. And years ago, I interviewed him and he said, in regards to you know, indigenous kids, if they don't know where they came from, how can they know where they're going? And I guess, you know, for me, this historical stuff, that somewhat applies, doesn't it? It is. Of course, it's not the same in cultural importance as this sort of Native American Renaissance, because we've never lost these things. We've these things have been protected from the beginning, even in Jefferson's well, own lifetime. Well, we may never have lost them, but you talked about students who walk by the orrery every day and pay no attention. True, but all I'm saying is that the work that you're doing is about is about cultural recovery, right? And that is so very important and contextualization. <laughs> well, you could make the argument that what you're talking about is cultural recovery too. I can't recover. I nearly had an exhaustive nurse, nervous breakdown over all this, and I couldn't believe that all these this grace, these gifts were being placed in my um, view shed in Philadelphia. And we didn't exhaust what's there at all. But what in my talk I said, in 1804, Philadelphia was the cultural capital of the new world. In some ways, it deserves to continue to be that. You know, we have kind of a, a misunderstanding of Philadelphia. We think of the Declaration of Independence and Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell and so on. Those are all very, very important things. But these places are the repositories of the of the Enlightenment's presence in America, and they are of monumental importance. And they deserve to be Philadelphia deserves to be better respected for what it still represents and the work that it does, the programming and the the publication and so on. And, and that leads me to sort of my last point, David, and that is that, you know, President Trump a, a few years ago signed a bill which extended the Lewis and Clark Trail from St. Louis to Pittsburgh because Lewis floated down the Ohio before he, you know, got to Clark and then St. Louis. 
I wish they had just gone all the way to Philadelphia and all the way to Monticello and all the way to Washington, D.C., because like every river, there are tributaries, and one is Monticello, no Jefferson, no Lewis and Clark. Another one is Pittsburgh, where he got the boat and started in on the actual voyage. But Philadelphia is... Jefferson sent Lewis to Philadelphia to get training so that he could be competent, at least, in the things that Humboldt was a master of. The savants of Philadelphia went out of their way, including Dr. Benjamin Rush, to train Lewis and to give him questionnaires and to try to get him ready for this journey. When you go to Philadelphia, and and even if you don't hold these things, if you just go to the tours of these um, entities, these museums, it changes the way you think about Lewis and Clark. In some ways, it ceases to be the great adventure story that we all love, and it becomes an enlightenment project that had um, imperfect results, let's say. And that is of... I'm going to write about this for WPO, and I'm going to propose that we extend the trail to Monticello, Washington, D.C., and Harper's Ferry and Philadelphia, because those are the tributaries that led... Lewis down that river and into fame. Well, it's not too late to do that. And uh, it, no. this is this has been real fun to talk with you this week about about all this in the in the final minute or so that we have. Uh, anything further you'd like to add? Well, let me just thank Michael Baranti, who was my host at the Library Company of America. Not to mention John and Chris Van Horn, who were survivors of my Lewis and Clark trip. Charles Cullen, the magnificent editor of the Jefferson Papers, now retired and his friend Melanie were there. They came up from Georgia just to be a part of it and to nag me about my lack of communication skills. Robert Peck, uh, who is a curator of art and artifacts at the Academy of Natural Sciences, was our host there. And Valerie Ann Lutz, this, <laughs> this manuscript curator at APS, went out of her way to make things available to me that I should never have seen. And so thanks to all of them and more. Rachel Hammer was my host. By the time I left and got on the plane to come back to North Dakota, I was as full of joy as it's possible to be and 100% exhausted from the overstimulation of this thing. It was wonderful. And David, I thought of you, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I tried to smuggle a few things back for you, but they just wouldn't let me. But we'll see you all next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701 575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.